Okay, so today we're going to switch gears and talk about um, So today we're going to talk about synaptic. Oops. Synaptic plasticity. The next two lectures will be talking about synaptic plasticity. So this is really, really shifting gears. So this um, last, I think, six, five, four, five, six lectures, we really talked about solving equations. Um, now we're gonna talk about, this goes in the category of facts about the brain. It's mainly facts about the brain. Um, we'll be doing some analysis, um, but here's what I mean by that. So we wrote down our favorite equation, tau di dot. Um, tau dvi the time evolution of the voltage of the neuron i was our some favorite equation minus vi minus e leak um, we have various forms some on j w i j Let's say V I minus E J. This was our um, actually times G J of T. That equation should look familiar. And today so what we're going to do today is focused on what does this weight mean? So what's a weight? Okay, so in a computer, of course, that's just a number when we, if we um, simulate these equations on a computer, but in the brain, there has to be some physical, con physical connection between synapses. So this is a picture we'll draw. So well, let's let's actually start with our. Okay, this is our this is a, a picture of a neuron. It's connected to other neurons, and they're connected via via some kind of axon. And when this neuron fires action potentials um, travel, travel down the action, the axon. And then I get to the other end. Um, and, uh, not again. Shoot, my pen stopped working. What is going on? Uh oh. Okay, my pen stopped working. This time I do not have a backup. Um,
Okay, that's good. So over here is a synapse. And that's what we'll be focusing on today. Okay, so let me draw a um, little picture of the synapse. Um, so the presynaptic neuron, at the, end of the, at the end of an axon, so this is in this direction, is two presynaptic neuron. So this piece here is basically corresponds to you know, the, 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 the end of this terminal right there. Um, and this is called a this is called a presynaptic bouton. And it's connected to the postsynaptic neuron, not always, but very often. This is a dendrite. And that goes to post. That goes to the postsynaptic neuron. Okay, and what we want to know what is what happens when an action potential travels from the presynaptic neuron down here, um, and how these two neurons talk to each other. Okay, so there's a relatively complicated sequence of events. Um, So action potential comes down. That causes an increase in voltage. So this is our action potential. So it's so, it's so complicated, miracle it works. When the action potential arrives at the presynaptic pre bouton, um, so it opens, so let's, label these things. This is number one. Number two, um, calcium channels open. Okay. Calcium channels open. When the calcium channels open, there's an influx of calcium. Um, kind of running out of room here. So influx of calcium, so three Ca plus plus goes into the cell and that causes some relatively complicated intracellular machinery. And the net result of that machinery is to, so in, well, it's inside the cell are So these green things are vesicles, and the vesicles are filled with the vesicles are filled with neurotransmitter. So you draw the neurotransmitter is, is orange. These are So they're filled with neurotransmitter, about 10,000 molecules of neurotransmitter, and the calcium arrives, neurotransmitter is released. So four neurotransmitters released. Okay. 
So these vesicles fuse to the, to the cell membrane, to the uh, buton, pre-traffic buton mem membrane, and you get little, and it diffuse across the synaptic cleft. Okay. Um, and when it does that at the postsynaptic side, it opens channels. So five, step five, opens channels. Okay. When the channels open, there's an influx of current. So this is six. Uh, influx of current. Current could come either positive or negative. Okay. And seven, that causes causes voltage change. Okay, when current comes in, it causes voltage change. And that voltage then propagates down the down the um, dendrite. Um, so that's eventually a voltage change eventually affects the soap. Okay. So as you can see, it's insanely complicated. It's sort of a miracle it works, but let's go over this um, again. So step one, action potential arrives. Arrives there. Um, that action potential causes an increase in voltage at synaptic bupton. The voltage actually rises by a lot. Um, the voltage causes an increase of calcium uh, current in here, it causes calcium current to flow. Um, because of an imbalance of, of, there's more calcium on the outside than the inside, and you, um, the voltage gated channels allow calcium influx. The pre synaptic turbine, you have these little boutons, um, small, very small sort of spheres filled with neurotransmitter. It infuses to the membrane right there. Um, neurotransmitters are released, those are the magenta dots. Uh, that opens a channel. The channel opens, allows current to flow. The current then affects the post synaptic um, cell. And um, the voltage goes up or down depending whether it's excited or inhibitory. And then it travels down to the cell. Okay, so it's it's pretty complicated. Um, like I say, it's kind of a miracle the whole thing works. So what we're going to talk about today is sort of the 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 details of this. So we're going to go through. We're going to talk about. Okay, we're mainly just going to talk about the details. Um, and there's, you know, besides this, it's not the hardest picture to remember, but it takes, you have to stare at it a couple of times before it sinks in. But what we're going to talk about is um, the postsynaptic current, the release, um, some of the, the math that goes behind this. And then we'll talk about the effects of plasticity on learning. But today, I think mainly it's going to be facts about the brain. Okay. So the first thing is, is, um, so what happens in, in, so in the postsynaptic cell, so what happens when the channel opens? Okay, so the channel opens, current flows, and the voltage at the postsynaptic membrane, V, is equal to, um, minus the conductance, let's say the mean conductance times X. Sorry, not V. The current flows, if you remember from biophysics, um, the current that flows into this channel is minus V um, X times uh, the voltage 
minus E leak. So this is the voltage difference. Remember the voltage on the inside um, is, so this is voltage on the inside re relative to the outside. So this is a standard um, standard thing we always have in in, in, in biophysics. Um, and next we'll talk about we'll talk about this shortly. And of course, this is called, this is basically the sort of the peak conductance. So it's sort of how permeably the channel is to current. And so, um, so what do we need to know? We need to sort of need to know. Um, so, so these um, precept nerve could either be excitatory inhibitory. Um, and so E leak, so if um, excitatory, there are two main kinds of, of excitatory neurons. So, so remember um, this leak potential or the reverse potential associated with the channel, that depends only on the presynaptic cell. So, and there are sort of two main kinds of, of and that's determined mainly by the neurotransmitter. So G, so EL um, so this depends on so E leak So it depends on our transmitter. Because neurotransmitter is this, this chemical that's, that's released here. Um, and it can be different things. It's actually a chemical, there are different kinds. Um, and there are four main kinds in the brain, two excitatory, two inhibitory. Um, so the excitatory ones are um, AMPA and NMDA. Um, and the reverse of potential, E leak is about um, zero mill millivolts. So about zero millivolts for both. Make them excitatory. Remember the um, memory potential on the inside of the cell tends to be negative. And, the, and basically the, the current that flows, so I, is a mix of sodium, potassium, uh, chloride, and calcium. It's pretty much everything. So it's sort of mixed. On average, you get an influx of current, okay? Um, for inhibitory, so the two main kinds are GABA, a and gamma B. They have much more negative leaks. In the case of gamma A, it's about minus seventy millivolts. In the case of gamma B, it's about minus one hundred. Minus. And 70 millivolts, and the current is mainly chloride. So when the gamma channel is open, uh, chloride flows in, which causes the net current to flow out, and these are inhibitory. And by the way, these things, it's, these names are really historically strange. These are named after agonists.
So agonist is something you can put on a cell that will mimic, mimic excitatory cells. So if you dump AMPA onto a cell, it opens onto a presynaptic glutamate, it opens um, AMPA channels. If you dump on something called NMDA, which you can buy, well, if you're, it's not that easy to get, but you can buy it, uh, you activate NMDA channels. GAB, on the other hand, is actually the neurotransmitter itself. Okay, so GABA is, I'm not sure what it means, it stands for gamma, the last A is an acid. Um, it's a neurotransmitter, so it's the thing that actually comes out of the presynaptic glutamate. So it took me a long time to figure that out, it's a bit confusing. Okay, so um, what we wanna do now is focus on this X. So the X here, that's the thing that changes uh, when the, Oops, chat. Not clear about the handwriting short. Um, let me see if I can figure that out. Oops. Um, oh, short Lee, sorry. Um, blue. Thank you, short Lee. Oops. Very sorry, short Lee. Uh, we'll talk about it shortly, so that means I'll talk about it in a few minutes. Um, but I'm actually going to talk about it now. So the focus now, like I say, is on this X. Um, so what happens, it's got its own dynamics. So X is, is basically, um, so the, the maximum conductor, the peak conductor is G bar, um, but exactly how big that is, it depends on the neurotransmitter um, and that's determined by X, which has its own dynamics. Um, so, go to the next page. Um, so X obeys the equation to so, um, tau, actually there's no tau. So DX DT equals minus alpha of C, so you see it in a second, times one minus X minus beta X. Okay, so X, we can think of X as, as sort of, so think to X is, X equals um, fraction of open channels on the postsynaptic luton. Okay, so when I drew this channel, I, I drew one of them. In fact, what really happens, of course, is um, we have lots and lots of channels. Okay, so you have lots of these are very small channels, of course. Um, you have lots of these. Um, the neurotransmitter arrives some fraction open, um, and that's determined by X. So X is a fraction of open ones. And C, C equals concentration of neurotransmitter. So the function of time um, 
So this is time. This is C. And this is basically, so spike arrives here. And C very, very quickly goes up. And then comes down. Okay. Um, it goes up when, it goes up basically this, this when the neurotransmitter arrives here, the concentration goes way up. Um, there's a quickly cleared away that doesn't last very long and then it drops down again. So it's a slightly idealized picture, um, but it's, it goes up and down pretty fast. Um, and when it does alpha, So this is alpha versus C, um, it is vice versa. Okay. Um, and so we're gonna we're gonna basically um, sort of abstract this picture into we'll think we really would care about alpha um, of C and really as a function of time, which we can just write as alpha of time of T. Um, So again, this is when a spike arrives. And it goes well, well approximately by going up very rapidly, peaking at alpha naught, and then coming down. So this high this top is plus alpha naught, and the time it's open um, is delta t. Okay. So what we want to do now is solve this equation. We're going to solve this equation, dx dt equals minus alpha of c times one minus x minus beta of x. Um, and it's basically x is going to be zero over here. So we'll solve this equation. Um, and our so initial conditions are that x at time zero, sort of x. So we want to basically know what happens here. Um, and you can kind of, you can kind of almost guess what's going to happen. Um, so we can plot this more or less. Um, you can see from here that um, when alpha is positive over here, when alpha is positive, um, x gets pulled toward one, and when alpha is zero. Um, X gets pulled towards zero, okay? So what happens is, um, now we're gonna plot X of T, it goes up. So X of T, it goes up relatively rapidly and then comes down. So this is X of T. Okay. So what we want to do is now solve this, this mathematically. It's not very hard. Um, so our equation is dx dt equals, um, let's say, alpha naught one minus x. By the way, did I write that? Oh, it should not be a minus sign here. Quite important. Um, minus beta x. For zero is less than, t is less than delta t. And then um, equals minus beta x. For t is very than delta t. Okay, um, and the first equation we're going to solve has a solution. So x of t um, equals. I'll just do this. It's it's um, so it's x zero e to the minus. I'll well, actually write it. Let's write this equation with them. Make it easy to solve. Um, so we're going to write it as alpha naught 
minus alpha naught plus beta x. And then it's, oh, sorry, dx dt. And that is a solution which is not hard to verify that x of t, so at very long times, it's going to be um, alpha naught over alpha naught plus beta naught, alpha naught plus beta, and then it's one minus e to the minus alpha naught plus beta t. Okay, so that's the right initial conditions. Um, I'm going to finish this off. This is one more thing, x at t equals zero, equals zero. So it's got the right, the right, you can easily verify this is right. It's got the right decay constant, which comes from here. Um, and asymptotically, as t goes to infinity, it's going to equal alpha naught over beta naught, which is the equilibrium solution. Okay. Um, so this is, this is for times um, zero is less than t is less than delta t. And then when t is greater than delta t, um, you get uh, dx, t, dx dt equals minus beta uh, x, which implies that x of t equals x at time delta t e to the minus beta t. Okay. Um, so this is basically what I drew here. Um, okay, chat. Okay. Okay, I think I answered your question. If not, ask again. Um, okay, so, so basically this, let's see if everybody's on the same page. Um, so, so this rise up here corresponds to this time course. It approaches one, and the k down here corresponds to the e minus beta t. Okay, and you can think of um, this term here. We can write e the minus t over tau rise. This is a time constant at which things rise. And we can write this thing as um, e to the minus t over tau dk. Okay. And different channels, remember the different kind of channels we have. Um, so our channels are AMPA, NMD, GABA, and GABA B, and they all have different rise and decay times. Um, and it's kind of good to know what they are just to get a sense of um, sort of time scales of synaptic transmission in the brain. Can I write these down? Um, and you should kind of know what these are, okay? Um, so we have AMPA, NMDA, GABA A and GABA B. There are three main kinds of neurotransmitters. Um, So it here, the tau rise time. And decay. Okay. And so for ampa channels, ampa channels are very fast. The rise time is about 0 0.1 milliseconds. 
The decay time is also pretty fast. It's around five minutes. Okay. NMDA is much, much slower. The rise time is one to five milliseconds. And the decay time is well, 150 to up to 1,000. These things can be open for a very long time. I'll see why in a second. Um, GABA is also fast, about 0.3 and maybe five milliseconds. And then um, GABA B is a lot slower. The rise time is around 10 milliseconds and decay is around 200. So these two are fast and these are slow, I'm sorry, slow. Fast and slow. And it's not really clear why we have multiple time scales. <clears throat> um, I'm guessing there's actually a very, very important reason for this, but nobody really knows what it is. For NMDA, we kind of know. Um, okay, so, so these are sort of facts. I'm going to tell you. <clears throat> One more thing about NMDA. So NMDA turns out to be uh, really, really important. Um, NMDA, it's, it's kind of different from the others. Um, and we'll see why in a second. So NMDA, we're gonna focus on NMDA. <clears throat> so before I wrote down that, where is it? Um, so all the way back here. So we wrote down that the current is basically this form. So X is the density of channels, G bar is the peak conductances. Um, when the neurotransmitter opens, uh, X uses, without any neurotransmitter in the synaptic cleft, X is zero. Uh, there's release, X goes up and then it comes down. And that's, that's true for most channels. NMDA channels are, very, are different though. NMDA channels, um, for those, the current I, NMDA so equals minus uh, the usual thing G bar X V minus E leak. Remember E leak would be uh, NMDA counts as around zero. And then this extra term here. It's one plus the concentration of magnesium, so you want a second divided by uh, some number, 3.57 nanomolars, details aren't so important, um, times it exponent of minus V, remember the um, voltage on the inside of the, of the postsynaptic bluton divided by 16.1, Millivolts. Good numbers aren't so important, um, but I'll tell you what this means in a second. So first of all, here's the picture for NMDA channels. So here's your NMDA channel down here. Um, and so this is NMDA. Okay. And outside the NMDA channel, um, there's magnesium in your brain. Magnesium is charged and these magnesium molecules basically block um, molecules block the channel. Okay, so magnesium, it floats around in extracellular medium. Um, it's, it's positive, positively charged. So remember, so V on the inside, so V at rest is around maybe minus 65 millivolts. Okay. Um, and because it's negative, my magnesium is positive, it's attracted, it just blocks the channels. Um, when the voltage goes up, 
So let's see the right this is. So this is V to at rest. Okay. If the voltage goes up, remember this this dendrite here goes to the soma. Uh oh. Um, so this is, goes to the soma, okay? Uh, and we'll talk about exactly what happened to the soma, but if, if the mem if the group postsynaptic neuron spikes, the voltage can travel from the soma back, the voltage goes up. And when that happens, um, so that's at rest. Um, so then, at, so V goes up. Um, a little hard to draw. Let's actually draw a new picture. Um, so this is this is the the picture when um, the voltage is at minus sixty five. Um, if the voltage were higher, the voltage were higher. Oops. You still have these magnesium molecules and they pushed away. Mm -hmm. Okay, they no longer block. This is V, let's say, equals around zero millivolts. And you can see, so when V is negative, what happens is, um, you can see it from this term. When V is negative, this term here is very large. Okay, so this is large when V is negative and make the NMDA current small. Um, when V is around zero, this term isn't so big, and, it, and so V is zero, this term is 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 one, um, and so the NMDA occurrence reduced a little bit, but it's not completely killed. Okay, and so what happens is when the um, let's draw a picture of what NMDA current looks like as a function of voltage. So if we have voltage on this axis, black. So we have voltage on this axis, V. So this is zero. Let's say this is minus 65. Um, actual plot current, not current voltage. Um, and if you look at this term, um, at very high voltages, so at high voltages, this thing is basically we can ignore it, okay? Um, and so what we can do is we can plot sort of this linear term here, okay? E leak is around zero. We're just going to ignore this and plot that term. Um, and that, of course, is just a straight line. Oops. This is, there's a straight line part of this. So this is the, oops, so this is the minus, so this is minus um, V minus E leak, part of our channel. Um, and then the NMDA part that kicks in, and the actual current is basically at very low voltage that goes like this. Okay. And this here is somewhere around minus 20. Okay. So what this means is the NMDA channels are open only when the postsynaptic voltage is kind of high. Okay. Worth writing down. NMDA channels are open only when the postsynaptic voltage.
is high. Okay. And the picture we have is here's our post-synaptic voltage. So this is post. There's some dendritic tree. Okay. And if you look out here, and so what can happen is, um, so a spike, so this neuron, remember, can, can, can fire an action potential, send something down the axon. So a spike causes what's called a backpropagating I'm not sure I can spell back propagating action potential. Okay. So we used to think of spikes as, as propagating down the axons, right? The spikes go in that direction, but they also go, um, the voltage, of course, also, if it's a big change, also goes in that direction. Okay. We do that. Um, the voltage goes up, and now if at the same time there's the spike out back the action potential, the voltage goes up out here. Um, so this is sort of step one. Step two, voltage goes up. And then step three, if we have from the presynaptic terminal, um, so step three, so basically we have spike in the presynaptic terminal. Terminal. So if that happens shortly, um, this is step three. So if step three happens shortly um, after there's a spike in the postsynaptic terminal, um, the voltage here is now large, okay? Because the voltage is propagated back up the, the um, dendrit dendritic tree, the voltage is large. And now um, step four, where we live out here, okay? Um, the voltage goes up and that puts us somewhere over here. And in that case, NMD current can flow, okay? Um, and it's all because of this magnesium block um, that we see right here, okay? The magnesium block at, at, low, volt at um, low voltage and at no block at high voltage, okay? So I'm going to actually um, take a short break right now, but let's let's sort of recap. This is it's, you can see it's sort of an this is all insanely complicated process. Um, so first, let's review what's going on here. Um, an action potential travels down presynaptic um, from the presynaptic neuron, opens calcium channels, releases neurotransmitter, opens channels. Okay, complicated multi-step process. Um, and we can talk about the channels. Uh, so what happens there? Um, it's basically some peak conductance and then X is the number of channels open or fraction of channels open. Um, there's a reversal potential which comes in several types. It's either sort of large for excitatory neurons, negative for inhibitory neurons. And then uh, the neurotransmitter determines the reversal potential, okay? Um, the dynamics of, of X, which is really what we care about, is shown right here. It goes up with some rise time and then decays. Um, and different neurotransmitters, just like um, they have different reversal potentials and also different time scales. Um, AMPA and GABA A are fast. Time scales of, of sort of milliseconds, sub millisecond rise time and millisecond decay. Um, whereas NMDA and GABA B are slow, for reasons we don't understand. 
You can see concern about in the NMDA selectivity. NMDA is a coincidence detector. Okay, NMDA is special in that its voltage is modified by this magnesium block. Um, if the voltage is low, um, this term is large, so the denominator is large and you get almost no current flow. Um, and that we can see here. And then, um, so this is a case where, so around rest, um, NMDA channels don't do much. Okay, they're count, at rest they're silent. Um, but at high voltages, they're very active. Okay, NMDA current can flow. And we'll see shortly there's basically um, what happens when it's an NMDA current is actual plasticity. So I'm gonna tell you one last thing before we take a break. Um, so it's a sort of blown up picture. So these are NMDA channels. I just draw one, but of course there are lots of them. Okay, when NMDA channels open, when there's, a, there's an influx of calcium, complicated things happen. And then so there's all sorts of complicated biophysical processes, um, kind of drawn like that. And the effect of that, of those processes um, is, so, so insertion, or deletion of amp channels. Okay. Um, okay, so let's go through this again. It's kind of complicated, again, kind of complicated. NMDA channels open, calcium comes in, and AMPA channels can be inserted or deleted. If AMPA channels are in, inserted, then basically the synaptic strength goes up. Um, if AMPA channels are deleted, synaptic strength goes down. So I write that down. Um, so um, and NMDA channels open. So influx of calcium. Um, so NMDA channels are either inserted. So W weight goes up. That's called LTP, long-term potentiation. It's the name or deleted. And the weight goes down. And that's called LTD. So L, T, so the L is long. The T is term. And then P is potentiation. And D is depression. So if you hang around neuroscientists, you'll hear long-term potentiation, LTP and LTD. I'll say these things all the time and it refers to strengthening and weakening of channels. Okay, so let's take about a five minute break and then I'll come back and we'll talk about the effects of, of plasticity.
Okay, let's go back to this picture. I'm a little worried my pen is no longer going to work. Um, so we have this picture here. When a spike arrives, okay, when a spike arrives, remember, uh, calcium influx and um, there's a release of neurotransmitter. Okay, but there's something that um, a bit strange about the brain. Sometimes when the spike arrives, calcium enters the channel, but there's no neurotransmitter release, okay? So, so, the, so sometimes, there are failures. And a failure, no neurotransmitter is released. Okay. Um, and surprisingly, that happens a lot, about half the time. So PR equals probability of release um, is around at central synapse in the brain, it varies between 0 0.2 to 0 0.8, okay? And so um, nobody really knows why, um, but it is a fact. And so that means, you know, so at the very beginning, we wrote down, we wrote down, um, here we wrote down a weight, right? So the question, what's a weight? It's kind of complicated. Um, and we'll see in a second, it gets a lot more complicated, but a weight, um, so the a weight that we can think of, of um, remember dx, let's say i dt equals, um, we're going to call g bar ij, I'll say what this means in a second, xij. B e, I minus E J. Okay. Um, so this is now uh, ne so neuron I. This is post neuron I. And this is presynaptic neuron J. Okay, so the weight WIJ is complicated. Now it's something like um, we can think of this as first of all G bar IJ, the bigger that is, the stronger the weight. But there's also um, P release IJ. So this is the release probability. So this is now we can think of this as the, um, so it's not clear what to call the weight, right? Because there's all sorts of complicated dynamics here. So this would be the average weight. Um, and we'll see in a second, that's, that's, even that is not exactly right. So the, trans, the, the, the synaptic strength can be, mod, so the synaptic strength um, is modulated by the brain during synaptic plasticity. When you learn, um, two things happen. So learning involving um, either the changing in, in G bar, as we can say, you can have insertion or deletion of AMPA channels, or else learning can also um, involve changing release probability, okay? 
Um, so if the brain wants to strengthen a synapse, it can either increase release probability or add channels. And in the uh, 90s, when I was first getting into, into neuroscience, there were endless arguments about whether the brain um, modified the, the this modified the G or the weights or the probability. And it turned out, of course, it's biology, it does both. Okay, and we'll talk a little bit about how in a while. But first, I want to tell you one more complication. So um, it turns out that, that this picture is a little more complicated. Um, so I'm going to sort of blow this up for the presynaptic terminals. Okay. So it, it turns out that this is sort of divided, divide, divided into zones. Okay, there's something called, so down here you have a bunch of synapses, a bunch of uh, vesicles. So in the readily releasable pool. It's called readily releasable pool. I think that's how you spell it. Um, I don't know how to spell readily. But it's pronounced readily releasable pool. Okay, so these are vesicles that can be easily released, um, sometimes called the active zone. And then, so the rest of the vesicles live up here and they have to migrate. So they have to migrate into the readily releasable pool. So what happens is um, when there's neurotransmitter release, okay, let's say a spike arrives and you actually get neurotransmitter release. Okay, something's released, oops. Don't know why that pen does that. So release of neurotransmitter depletes the readily releasable pool, okay? So what that means is when neurotransmitter is released, um, do I have a picture? So if, if a vessel is released, Um, readily releasable pool. Is depleted somewhat and P release goes down. Okay, so P release is. It's his probability, um, so it's, it's bad enough we have a release probability, it's actually modulated um, by what's happened previously. Um, as far as we can tell that given a pre-release, release is random, but if it does happen, a release goes down. But that's not the whole story, even that isn't the whole story, um, because remember there's influx of calcium here. So there's calcium influx. And the channel opens, there's calcium influx, and the calcium tends to stay there for a while. Okay. So, um, in addition to this, so um, if, so calcium, calcium builds up, um, builds up. Um, so if there are two spikes close together, together, um, P release goes up. On the second one. 
Okay. So release probability is, is, is sort of, it's, it's complicated. Um, so we can think of plotting versus time. Versus time, we plot release probability, PR. So it's got some baseline value, call it P naught, okay? Call this P naught. Um, and if we focus only on, so this, the PR goes down, so we can draw one at a time. Um, in this case, what happens is, um, let's say these are the times for the spikes. These are spike times, presynaptic spike times. So these are spike times. Okay. Um, so every time there's a spike and there's release, okay. So peanut, um, peanut, there's a spike. Um, this time, let's say there's release, so that probability goes down. Comes up, let's say there's a spike, no release, nothing much happens. Um, here, there's release, it goes up and then it comes down. Okay, so release probability, this is due to, um, this is sort of, Call this one, and this is two, so this is one. Okay. Um, if, on the other hand, we focus only on um, short term sort of the, so facilitation, um, what happens is now, let's say the release, oops, so here. Um, probably release goes up, it comes down, goes up, comes down, goes up, it comes down. Okay, so this is two. This is calcium buildup. So calcium buildup causes release to go up. Um, depletion of readily releasable pool causes um, it to go down. And of course, both of these are active at once. Um, it's kind of hard to model both of them at once. To model both at once, You'd have to explicitly model the calcium buildup um, and then have the calcium buildup affect the release probability. Um, it can be done. But what we're going to do instead is model um, these things one at a time. So either there's, there's facilitation associated with calcium buildup or depression associated with calcium uh, with depletion of relative diesel pools, and then look mathematically at the implications of that. Um, for the least probability. So we can actually write down equations that tell us um, what happens when, so it gives us a description of, the, of these curves. Um, I'm not sure how much detail I'll go into. It's, it's kind of important to know these techniques. Um, so we're gonna, we wanna write down um, an equation for, for least probability. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the implications of this. Um, so you write tau d p r d t is equal to p naught. I won't go into too much detail. It's sort of intuitive p r. So if nothing's happening, the release probability is pulled toward p naught. Um, p naught is is this dash curve over here, um, so this is P naught. Um, if there's a spike though, two things can happen. So we're gonna add in a um, plus now I'm gonna put in a delta, oh, let's add sum on, I'll put the sum on J delta of T minus TJ. We've seen delta functions before, but a little more detail. Um, and so this one in two terms. If it's depression, we have minus 
one minus some variable called FD and times squiggle J. I'll tell you what this in a second, um, times P release. And then we have plus um, F, F, one minus P release. Okay. Um, so T, TJ equals presynaptic type spike time. And squiggle J equals one if there's a release. Um, if neurotransmitter is released, it's released. And zero otherwise. Okay, because remember, our interpretation of depression is is depletion of readily releasable pool. If nothing's released, nothing's depressed. Um, and we're going to consider these one at a time. So first, we have to sort of understand. So the delta function. Um, so this delta function, this quantity here. Basically, a mathematical way of telling us there's a jump. Okay. Oops. And as you can see, I forgot one of the jumps. Okay. So the delta function tells us about the jump here. Um, okay. And it takes this. So there's a jump here, of course. Um, so delta function is sort of, a, it's a really convenient mathematical, um, it's almost a trick. Um, and let's go over exactly what it means. Um, and so this is something we've encountered before, but I'll be, um, take a little bit of an aside. Well, actually, we don't have to go into much detail. Um, the delta function, remember, just to remind you, um, So delta of t minus tj as a function of time. This is time on this axis. And this is time tj. So it's really, really steep. So really, it's basically, so it's infinitely high. And area equals 1. Okay, and really all it does is tells us that when a spike arrives and there's release, you want, um, so this term here, the spike arrives and release goes to the minus sign, um, release probability goes down, and over here, um, because of the plus sign, release probability is equal to one, okay? And so what I'm gonna do is solve these equations. Um, actually, I'm gonna focus on, on depression only, in some ways, it's more interesting. I'm going to solve these equations um, both when there's not a spike, when there is a spike. So the nice thing about a delta function, when there's no spike, um, go to a new page. So, okay. So I just rewrite this equation for um, depression. So depression. So we have tau d dr dt equals p naught minus pr um, minus tau delta sum on j delta of t minus tj. So you get a kick every time there's a spike from the delta function. And then we have 1 minus fd. And squiggle J. Okay. So again, this is our zero one variable. 
Okay, so we're gonna solve these, this equation um, basically as a function of time. So this is T, the TJs are right here. So this is time, P release, um, to P naught. And basically what we wanna do is say, um, the right after a spike probability that may have gone down, so we're going to call this time here. Um, so TJ plus equals um, time immediately um, let's say uh, after spike. And TJ minus equals time immediately before spike. Okay. So immediately after a spike, so after a spike, when there's no spike, so no spike, this term is zero. Okay. So we can write sort of, um, so in this region, we can write PR of T equals, actually um, have TJ minus or plus right after a spike um, times E to the minus, um, actually, right, just in a different way. So um, if you waited a long time between spikes, what do we get? Um, PR of T, J plus um, equals, so P naught times one minus E to the minus, minus T minus T J over tau. Okay, this is for T greater than T J. These are tasks. Okay. So this is this makes sense. At very long times, if you wait a really long time um, after the spike, I mean eventually this is going to go back to P naught. Okay. Um, but it decays exponentially with this time constant, time constant tau. Okay. Um, and then what happens when uh, there's a release and you arrive? So, so re, um, basically because of the delta function, so, um, so if, if squiggle i squiggle j equals one, that means there's a release, then the change in P, uh, PR equals PR, at t, so let's say j plus one um, plus minus p release at tau j plus one minus um, is basically it just jumps up um, by an amount from this factor of one minus f d equals. Um, one minus FD times PR at time tau J plus one minus, okay? So it tells us really, it tells us, you know, as a release, this release here should be evaluated right before spike, um, sort of makes sense physically. And then this is our jump. So this term here is our, Jump. Do the rather releasable pool, and this is what happens over here. So this is, so this is a jump. Okay, neurotransmitter release, so the probability goes down. Um, 
So minus um, equals, the very important is a minus sign here, okay? It goes down and we can, we can take um, least probability, oops, put it over on the other side and we get um, PR So PR right after a spike, tau J plus one plus um, equals FD compression uh, constant times PR of tau um, J plus one minus. So basically, it's re it's reduced by a factor of FD relative to what it was before, and this is of course if um, swiggle J equals one if there's a release. Okay, and this actually um, has kind of a nice feature. Um, let's increase. So let's say you have. Um, a neuron with, with, so we have a picture of a neuron. And let's consider two synapses. The one here. So consider synapse here. There we go. And the incoming spike train is like coming to really high rates, all right? With the synapse here, the incoming spike rate is, is a lot lower. Um, so this one is firing a lot higher. Um, it, it has a bigger effect, that's fine. Um, but what happens if, if, if the firing rate of this one changes, okay? So this one dominates. So this, Synapse has a big effect. I don't know what's going on here. Um, dominates. And so what that means is this synapse um, mainly ignored. It's mainly ignored. So this is a picture with no depression. Okay, but let's, let's actually ask what happens when there is synaptic depression. Um, so we'll assume that both synapses, this is PR on this axis, we'll call this P naught. Um, so we'll assume that both synapses have the same background probability. So we'll consider first, um, this is synapse one. So this is synapse one. And because it's firing really fast, what happens? Um, it basically, you know, it's a high firing rate. So it, you know, it basically it ends up in fluctuations, but it kind of ends up at kind of a low release probability. And physically what's happening is uh, the spikes are happening, coming so fast, that this readily releasable pool is depleted, right? It loses all its vesicles. Um, so the release probability gets really low. Okay. So this synapse on the other hand, we'll call this synapse number 
Number two. Oops. This is synapse number two. Um, so basically, it's, it's, it, it, it doesn't spike very often, right? Um, okay. So its release probability is actually high. So what this happens is, you know, with no depression, you have this completely dominating synapse, okay? Um, if you include depression, basically the, the release probability is low, but the firing rate is high and they more or less cancel. So this is called, um, so this is sort of, oops. So this is called synaptic democratization. Um, uh, kind of a bad name. Synaptic democratization. Um, basically, it means that even with high high firing synapses, their release probability goes down, so they sort of end up having the same effect as low firing rate synapses. Um, Transiently, if this thing immediately starts firing, so early on the high firing rate is going to have a big effect, right? But after a while, um, which happens a lot in the brain, um, brains often just mainly interested in transients. So this tra this high firing rate, which initially had a large effect in the long run, does. Okay, so we've covered a lot today. Um, so the main thing I want you to remember is is this kind of complicated picture here, okay? Of, of it's, it's this multiple, multi-step process, active potential arrives, calcium channels open, neurotransmitter is released, gate channels are open and postsynaptically, um, causes current to flow, the voltage changes, and the release probability, um, and then the other sort of, um, sort of th things to take home. So I want you to remember this picture, just kind of have to memorize it, okay? Um, the other thing to take home is that, um, where are they? NMDA channels are weird. They're voltage dependent. So NMDA channels um, sort of are, are play a very critical role in plasticity because they act as coincidence detection. And then the final thing to remember is that um, release is probabilistic, okay? Sometimes when a spike arrives, there's release, and sometimes there isn't. And this allows, um, you know, democratization of, of synaptic circuits. Okay, so let's end there, um, and I'll see everybody in two days. And I have to actually run, so I can't stay around. And this will be on the website in, in a couple hours. Okay, see you in a couple of days.